Russia. The place that has evoked wonder, terror and intrigue for the better half of the last century. Often a point of fixation from the West, for Western left dissidents in the 60s it was seen as a place of safe haven. In the 90s it was seen as a place of collapse and ruin and now in the new century it is seen as a place of nationalism, corruption and oligarchy. But who runs Russia? What forces will the power structures and exert control? Is Putin in charge or are there darker, more malevolent forces at play? These questions what I seek to answer in this film. The answers to these questions will revolve around three individuals specifically who have shaped the domestic governance and shape of Russian power in the new century. But first, let's rewind and establish a quick history of Russia. Russia's history is long, bloody, and dark. For the sake of you, the viewer, and for my sanity, I will not divulge into all the intricacies of its Tsar's orthodox religiosity, revolutions, and wars. Instead, I will utilize the historical perspective of how power has been shaped by men behind the curtain for a long time in Russian politics. A Russian tradition where men with radical views and humble beginnings come to control the course of history. What stands out with Russian politics above all else is the proclivity of Russian domestic policy to be shaped by intellectuals, radicals and fringe thinkers that too become embedded within the deep state of its eternal affairs. Take the most well known of all, Rasputin. Grigory Rasputin is a fascinating man. He was a self-proclaimed prophet who rose staggeringly fast through Russian society. Born in Siberia, he was a small town man, married and fathered three children. He attended a Russian Orthodox monastery where, unlike other monks at the time, he kept ties with his family and the outside world. He eventually came to the attention of Tsar Nicholas II and his inner circle. Once he found himself in this inner circle, he began to undermine, contort and control the most powerful regime in Russian society. He advised Nicholas II on ministerial appointments and making political decisions with the Tsar during World War I, much to the dismay of the Russian aristocracy. He was often drunk, cheating on his wife with prostitutes, socialites, and also rumored to be in an affair with the Empress, a holy man that was far from holy, that had unparalleled access to the inner workings of one of the biggest empires in the world. How did one man, a peasant, from the barren landscape of Siberia come to find himself in the palace of St. Petersburg. Be he a Christian, a sociopathic manipulator or spiritual advisor, what Rasputin learned early on is the power of perception management. You see, as a man who claimed he was holy, spoke with such religious fervor, despite all the actions of the contrary, he was believed to have been special, a true holy man to the Tsar and his inner court. He basked in his fame. He sought that everyone know his power and influence, a self-proclaimed representative of the peasantry. He knew the perception of him being a maverick, a renegade, a dissident that was accepted into the elite political class worked well for him. But he also came to know the price for fame and unprecedented power in the Russian elite.
His rise to power and his perception that he flaunted unparalleled power and access to the inner workings of the Russian elite pissed off the masses. In his later life, he was rumored to have treasoned with the Germans and brought the cholera epidemic to Russia before he met his grisly end, shot in the palace that he loved. Rasputin's story, or rather his rise from unknown peasant from Siberia to one of the most influential men in Russian society, foregrounds what we see in Russia today. A fringe radical, mystic, and man who snubbed convention becomes embedded into the deep state of Russian affairs. The next man we can look at is not one who necessarily came from humble beginnings, but instead shows us that the status of Russian intellectuals wields more power than that of politicians, as the former often comes to seize power from or obliterate the latter. This is personified in probably the most well-known Russian of all time. His name is Vladimir Lenin, and he has shaped modern history, not just in Russia, but the world over for the last century. Whilst different from Rasputin, who uses status as self-proclaimed mystic to garner influence and power, Lenin used intellectualism, Marxist theory and ideology to galvanize the Russian people and to overthrow one of the most powerful families on the planet. His bastardized version of Marxism ultimately led to the Soviet Union, the second largest superpower in the world. The Soviets were later instrumental in defeating the Nazis in World War II and over the course of most of the 20th century, developed a threatening nuclear arsenal, launched men into space and became America's most prolific opponent. And the whole system the Soviets created was conceptualized and created through the authoritarian intellectualism of Lenin and later Stalin. Stalin was yet another figure who came from the margins of the system right into its center. He was born in Georgia, was a petty criminal in his youth, an outsider, and as history often rhymes, especially in Russia, Stalin found himself central to the Soviet project. What this brief historical context is hopefully highlighting is that Russian history for more than a century has been shaped by madmen, intellectuals and outsiders. Rasputin, Lenin and Stalin were all outsiders who were exiled, impoverished and living on the fringes of society. But what unites these three men apart from their unconventionality was they all came from the outside into the system only to tear it all down. The Soviet Union was synonymous with secrecy, secret police, secret judicial proceedings, and secret dissent. 
a web of bureaucracy with corruption deeply entrenched into the fabric of its political DNA. The Soviet project was short-lived, but changed the world forever. What was left after it collapsed was a power vacuum that needed to be filled one way or another. Q, the selling off of its industries and the introduction of the new Russian elite, its oligarchs and managerial elite. Money, like the rest of the modern world, came to rule Russia. From the ruins of the Soviet Empire emerged Boris Yeltsin. It is speculated that Yeltsin himself actively sought the breakup of the Soviet Union for his own political ambitions. Not surprising as he made himself and his cronies around him very, very rich. Boris Yeltsin immediately wanted Russia to enter into the global free market and rid itself of the centralized control economy of its Soviet past. And so we began the mass sell-off of the country. Its assets, its resources, its industries all sold. And the Russian economy was sent into free fall. The people that essentially seized the Russian economy bought it through insider trading and secret meetings behind closed doors. Russia was now a land of the oligarch, of the ultra-rich and the underclass, a schism of inequality that is still endemic today. But there was still a power vacuum. Yeltsin, while succeeding in his short-term plan, had made numerous enemies whilst in power. He didn't have the power or will to command his followers to obey him. He had opened the door to greed, corruption and instability, and he could not tame the beast he had conjured. What Russia needed was a vision, an idea or conception to rally behind. The fall of the Soviet project had dealt a critical blow to a unifying concept the public could all take pride in. But who could shape the future of this country that was economically redundant? A country with a public whose trust in the government was so eroded, it was non-existent. This is where the man who is merely the face to the men behind the curtain enters our story, Vladimir Putin. A former KGB officer and Prime Minister under Yeltsin. He has been enveloped in the Russian political class for decades. And he is the man who will become the driving force of not his own vision for the Russian future, but for the wants and direction of the radicals, intellectuals and free thinkers who have been waiting on the sidelines since the demise of the Russian state. The men behind the curtain. With the Russian country in a perilous and vacuous state of liminality, Russia needed a vision, a rubric for which to define the state by in the new century. It needed a robust system, a system that maintained the status quo of the powerful elites, but did not stir up the discontent of the public, who were slowly becoming more and more pissed off by the day. Enter Mr. Distraction, Vladislav Surkov. Surkov is an incredibly fascinating man, he is often cited as Putin's Rasputin and is quite arguably one of the most influential Russians of the 21st century. He is the architect behind the modern sovereign democratic system Putin has enjoyed for 21 years. The founding father of Putinism, non-linear war and the man who has shaped Putin's legacy for decades. He was born in, well, even that is unknown concretely, or his age for that matter. And this foreshadows almost everything about his life to come. He started out in military intelligence, before becoming a student at the Moscow Institute of Culture, studying theatre direction. He later went into advertising in the 80s after the Soviet government relaxed restrictions on private businesses. From director to PR guy. Both his experience in theatre direction and advertising were pivotal moments in Surkov's life. Both demonstrated the power that is inherent in perception management, and he would apply both the theatrics of performance and the persuasion of advertising onto the defunct political system of Russia in the early 2000s. His background in theatre direction and advertising were fundamental in his weaponizing of perception management. In Surkov's own words, 
people needed to see themselves on stage. In this mass comedy, there is a director, there is a plot, and this is when I understood what needed to be done. Surkoff understood political theater, how people can be persuaded and manipulated to act against their own self-interest as long as there is direction. This was fundamental in his conception of Putinism and sovereign democracy. Putinism, in short, is the phenomena of Putin's current regime and the people who wield the influence of power being dictated by relations with Putin rather than any democratic input by the masses. It is oligarchical, uncompromising and autocratic. It is the embodiment of Russia in the 21st century thus far. It isn't unique to Russia, i.e. the political establishment and its cronies wielding unbounded political power, but it is certainly a lot more entrenched into the constitution, political institutions and establishments more than most other countries. Sovereign democracy is a lot more brilliant in its conception and maybe a lot harder to put back into its cage. In Surkov's own words, Putin did not abolish democracy, but instead married it to the monarchical archetype of governance. Think of what we saw in the pre-revolutionary days with Rasputin and Nicholas II, coupled with modern nation-state democracy. It is just the right amount of freedom and just the right amount of dictatorial order. It is the right balance of freedom, diversity, homogeneity and order. How Surkov came to direct sovereign democracy is genius. He works for Putin's party, United Russia, whilst also supporting opposition groups who were under the command of the Kremlin parties like Rodinia. He then lets it be known to the public that he is funding both the government and the opposition, therefore exhibiting for all the masses to see the illusion of choice in its true form. Merely an illusion. The public is apathetic, knowing their vote doesn't matter anyway. All parties are the same, they think thereby giving up on democracy as a concept. Any genuine opposition that does come along is either labelled a foreign-funded party that works against the Russian sovereignty and for the nation's adversaries, or is, even better, cast with the same apathetic indifference of, oh, they're all the same, and therefore will be unlikely to gather enough support or momentum to challenge anything. The status quo is maintained, Putin remains unchallenged, the people get the vote and to act out democracy and participate in the performance. And the show goes on. Reality is directed by the orders of the men behind the curtain. The populace who are the spectators suspend their disbelief and surrender themselves to the false illusion of choice and freedom. Russia as a reality show. Surkov married monarchy and democracy, order and freedom, theatre and politics, and it worked. Putin has remained in charge for almost two decades. Surkov not only rewrote how governance and order could coalesce around a mutually assured illusion, but his political ingenuity didn't stop there. Surkov also reshaped the way a nation was to conduct warfare. Russia annexes Crimea in eastern Ukraine. At the beginning of this invasion, a man named Natan Dubovitsky published a short story called Without Sky. Without Sky is a war story told in the future after the Fifth World War. It details the birth of what is called non-linear war. It was the first non-linear war. In the primitive wars of the 19th and 20th century, it was common for just two sides to fight, two countries, two groups of allies. Now four coalitions collided, not two against two or three against one, no, all against all. And what coalitions? Not like the ones you had before. It was rare for whole countries to enter. A few provinces would join one side, a few others a different one. One town or generation or gender would join yet another. Then they could switch sides, 
sometimes mid-battle. This was the ushering in of perpetual war, of constant mobilization. The significance of this writer writing this story at the onset of the war is that the author, Natan Dobovitsky, is the pen name of none other than Vladislav Surkov. Surkov, under an alias or not, offers us insight into the new game of war Russia is playing. Invading Crimea was audacious, brazen, wrong and blatant. And there was nothing the West could do about it. It was a brazen act of independence away from the judiciary, dictations of the UN, The Hague and other international conventions countries must go through to declare war. It was also a distraction. Russia never called it an invasion, yet it was one. They never outrightly supported any side, yet they funded pro-Kremlin mercenaries in conflict and let it be known to all sides. Putin's ratings went up and the tensions and conflict in the region, whilst forgotten, are still ongoing, paradoxical and perpetual. It is non-linear, with no clear sides, no clear end goal and perpetual mobilization. The only one who benefits is the Russian elite who enjoy nationalism to be riled up and in turn heightening their approval ratings when it is convenient for them. And what makes it even more brazen is that the intent of the whole plan is written by none other than Surkov himself. Though he denies Natan was ever him, he does it in perfect Sokovian fashion. He writes the preface to the book denying he is the author, signed by himself. He lets it be known he is the author without ever coming out as being the author. He lets it be known he is playing tricks on you, and you are powerless in stopping him. Paradox perpetuated is a distraction to the masses. Confused, they see no other one to follow but those that are leading the way. Before we begin digging into our next guy, let's step back a second. I want to talk about Ivan Ilyin. Ilyin ties in nicely with our next man, so I think looking at Ilyin is a nice segue for some context on Alexander Dugin and the intellectual influence of Putinism. Ivan Ilyin was an early 20th century Russian philosopher, hugely into orthodox religion, a proponent of Christian fascism and a believer in the Institute of Monarchy being a stabilizing force in society. Obviously, he wasn't very popular in communist Russia. He was expelled in 1922. He saw the communists as a plunderer of the Russian state, and is perhaps infamously known nowadays as a proponent of Hitler. His reasoning for which was that Hitler, to him, symbolized civilization's last stand against Bolshevism. Among many things, Ilyin believed in a third way of organizing the state. That is, away from Western liberalism and away from the communist state. This third way would organize the laws of Russian society around traditional morality and religiousness. He believed that inequality is natural and that it is up to the intellectual elite to offer moral guidance and support for the plebeians of society. Hence his staunch support for monarchy. He believes in monarchic society, the consciousness of law unites people and entrenches cultural and religious traditions within the fabric of society. Whereas the consciousness of law in a republic or a state without monarchy is perpetually changing and therefore not anchored to the sacred moral truth inherent in religion or monarchy. A question that blighted Ivan Ilyin was this. How did Russia go from monarchy to what he deemed the disaster of the revolution? In essence, how did order, tradition and century-old institutions dissolve seemingly overnight? His conclusion was that in essence there was a deep mistrust between people and the state. The state was not spiritually leading the masses. 
How could a leader galvanize their influence and power to contort and control the masses to prevent another plundering of Russian society seen in the October Revolution? Or the plundering of the state post-Soviet collapse with what Putin called the worst geopolitical disaster in modern Russian history? Well, one answer would be feverish nationalism, a reactionary pivot towards conservative religiosity and reclaiming the militaristic prowess in Eurasia. Ilyin is still highly regarded amongst contemporary Russian political elites. Putin himself saw to it that Ilyin's remains be returned to Russia in 2009. His ideas from Ukraine to the ideas of religiousness and tradition have made huge comebacks in Russian discourse in recent decades. Some examples of these ideas that have come back in a big way are that the reality of the world is subjective. Ilian believed the world was a mistake by God. Therefore, these things we call facts are of little importance. They aren't necessary and shouldn't be taken too seriously. Reality is subjective, so therefore can be shaped and lies can be whirled into existence as being facts. People can be directed and contorted at the will by those in power as nothing is real. Think of Surkov and his avant-garde campaign to turn Russian politics into a stage play. Second is that democracy is a ritual. Yes, people can participate in the facade if it quells their disdain and anger. What they vote for is irrelevant. The people they get to choose between have already been chosen. They just have to participate in the act to make them believe that they have a say in how things are run. This is quite clearly evident in contemporary Russian politics and also to some extent in the West too. Thirdly, and what brings us to our next contemporary man behind the curtain, is Ilian's belief that Russian nationalism is the only hope to restore order to the world. Ilian's logic being that the Russian people are in some ways descended from God. They are the Holy Ones, one of the oldest civilizations out there, and therefore only with unified and empowered Russia can the world submit to its greatness once more and order shall be restored. So, how did Ilian's old ideas become cool again? To put it simply, after the vacuum that emerged after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian political elite have been vying to fill the vacuum. Surkov took the idea of the spectacle of reality, the ability to direct the masses at the whim of authority, and Putin, admirable of the nationalistic, cynical view of democracy that Ilian espoused, implemented a new way forward for Russian politics. There is another man who is largely responsible for the vacuum being filled with orthodox religion, feverish nationalism, and calling for a new third way against Western liberalism. He is a man named Alexander Dugin. Inspired by Ivan Ilyin, Dugin has become one of the architects of a new way of Russian governance, often referred to as Putin's brain. Dugin has rehashed the ideas of Ilian and reappropriated them for a new epoch of Russian governance. Putin and Dugin are both admirers of Ilian's views on state, traditions, conservatism, nationalism, and militaristic expansionism. So, who is Dugin and what are some of his beliefs? First, I'll contextualize some of his broad ideas. Dugin has been described by Michael Milliman an eminent Dugin scholar, as the chief ideological architect of contemporary Russia. Whilst Russia is constitutionally forbidden to have an ideology, Dugin has shaped a lot of the political discourse ongoing in Russian society today. Dugin is a proponent of Eurasianism. Eurasianism, in some regards, is an attempt to counter the West's cultural dominance. By unifying Russia with its European and Asian neighbors, Dugin hopes that Eurasian nations will be united on shared civil and cultural commonalities. Dugin hopes that these United States could challenge the Western hegemony by propagating alternative shared common ideals such as traditionalism, conservatism, religion, the sanctity of marriage and family. Essentially, Dugin is a firm believer that traditionalists should be against Western liberalism. Dugin and indeed some traditionalists the world over believe that the West has imposed its values on the rest of the world for too long. Values such as reason and science trumping faith and religion. Dugin believes they should be able to coexist and reason shouldn't be the chief end goal of Russian life. 
Dugan compares the West to a fallen angel that has tried to replace God in understanding the world on its own, without relying on faith. Not only reason and will, but Dugan is also against the ideological implementation of the West for things such as diversity and human rights, both of which Dugan believes to be hypocritical and postmodern denials of deeply embedded cultural traditions. For example, the West preaches diversity yet cannot tolerate Sharia law. Dugan would posit, isn't Sharia law simply a diversive idea on governance? Dugan is in short against the imposition of a Western monoculture, an almost arrogant notion that the West holds that its values are true and sacred, and other countries need to be bombed into submission, for example Afghanistan, to catch up to its superiority. Dugan believes the West has failed to understand Russia and its Eurasian neighbors. The West has denied the thousand-year-old civilizational codes and traditions and disregarded their attempts at ideological independence because it does not align with the doctrine of Western liberalism. In short, Dugan is against globalization, particularly the ideological arm of globalization. There's a lot to cover with Dugan, like Surkov and Ilian, so now that a brief introduction to him is out the way, for the sake of brevity, let's take a look at one of his key influential texts, Foundations of Geopolitics, and how, as you'll see, has come to be eerily prophetic and a guideline for Putin's rule. Foundations of Geopolitics was written by Dugin in 1997, just before the turn of the new millennium. To contextualize the text, we need to remember that this was written in a very tumultuous period of Russian history. From the latter days of the Soviet Union to the transition into modern-day Russia, it was written during an ideological vacuum. Foundations of geopolitics made Dugin famous. Historian John Dunlop stated that there has probably not been another book published in Russia during the post-communist period which has exerted a comparable influence on Russian military, police and statist foreign policy elites. It is still given as a textbook for the Russian Academy of General Staff in the Russian military. The book was anticipated to be the ideological foundational bedrock of Russian military strategy going forward. In Foundations of Geopolitics, Dugin discusses a range of geopolitical issues that would help reassert the Russian nation as a force to be reckoned with in the world. In essence, the book serves as a framework on how Russia can be a genuine challenge to US-dominated Atlanticism and how Russia can spearhead Eurasianism as a counterweight to Western hegemony. The idea being that Russia can do this through strategic annexations and alliances. Essentially, the book aims to propagate the narrative that it is the US who is to blame for the ills of modern day Russia. Why is it to blame, you may ask? Well, Dugin saw Atlanticists as the people who ruined Russia at the end of the 20th century. Dugin saw the project that westernizing Russian reformers attempted to implement during the Gorbachev and Yeltsin years as futile, stating that this project denies such values as the people, the nation, history, geopolitical interests, social justice, the religious factor, etc. In it, everything is constructed on the principle of maximal economic effectiveness on the primacy of the individual on consumerism and the free market. Additionally, Dugan believed that Atlanticists, especially in the United States, consciously plotted the downfall of the Warsaw Pact and the USSR. The heartland, therefore, is required to pay back sea power in the same coin. The goal, as Dugan sees it, is to resuscitate and reinvigorate Eurasia and Russia after the near-fatal geopolitical blows it absorbed from 1989 to 1991. Dugan, in short, wants revenge. Straight out the gate, one way to achieve this is by spreading anti-American sentiment everywhere. This anti-American propagation is crucial in maintaining an in-group, out-group unity within Russia. It also galvanizes Russians to steer away from liberalism and free market consumerism and favor more traditional and religious practices. Throughout Foundations of Geopolitics, Dugan reasserts a common sentiment echoed by historian Sir Halford Mackinder. Russia was and always will be in permanent conflict with the West. Additionally, the book serves as a framework in conceptualizing the Eurasian project. Another key idea that permeates through the book is that Eurasia needs to organize itself around shared Eurasian ideals, 
not just Russian ones. A pan-nationalistic rhetoric. His reasoning for doing this can be attributed to the quote by new right theorist Jean-Francois Thirat, who said the main mistake of Hitler was that he tried to make Europe German. Instead, he should have tried to make it European. Russia, therefore, should not make a Russian empire, but a Eurasian one. The Eurasian empire will be constructed on the fundamental principle of the common enemy, the rejection of Atlanticism, the strategic control of the USA, and the refusal to allow liberal values to dominate us. So, how does Dugin hope to establish a Eurasian empire that will become a genuine contender to Atlanticism? Well, let's take a look at the different areas of the world and how, to what extent, Dugin foresaw or foreshadowed key geopolitical events and disruptions in his text, Foundations of Geopolitics. First, let's start with Europe. At the core of his European strategy, Dugin wants to weaken the relations between America and Europe. To do this, Dugin posits that France and Germany form a bloc that would essentially take control of the European continent, with Germany taking the lead. Dugin hoped for this particularly as they both have a history of anti-Atlanticism sentiment. To some extent, this anticipation by Dugin has come into play as Germany and France have become the two powerhouses of the European Union. Merkel and Macron are seen as the de facto leaders of the organization. And with the last president particularly, it seems as if Dugin's prophecy was coming into full fruition. A second hope Dugin held was that the UK who Dugin regarded as simply a vassal state of the United States, be cut off from Europe. An eerily precise prophecy, which we all saw with Brexit, which was arbitrated to some extent through a huge Russian disinformation campaign, a move that is straight out of the Dugin playbook. Southeastern Europe, namely Romania, Northern Macedonia, Serbia, Bosnia and Greece, would be the Orthodox East, as they follow similar lines of religiosity and tradition. And for some of these countries, Russian sentiment is at a high. In others, fascism is also creeping back into public discourse. Finally is Ukraine, which Dugin thought should be annexed by Russia. Dugin viewed Ukraine as a state that has no geopolitical meaning, no particular cultural import or universal significance, no geographic uniqueness, no ethnic exclusiveness. Its certain territorial ambitions represent an enormous danger for all of Eurasia, and without resolving the Ukrainian problem, it is in general senseless to speak about continental politics. Considering that Dugin wrote this in 1997, the annexation of Crimea shows to a large extent the influence of Dugin and Surkov's ideological influence within key Russian geopolitical strategy, and how his predictions from 1997 still permeate in the decision-making practices of the Russian military elite. Next, let's look at the Middle Eastern strategy. For the Middle East, a lot less has been predicted, possibly because the geopolitics of the Middle East are and have been volatile for the last four decades. But here are some of the key points. The Islamic-Russian continental alliance would be crucial, as, at the core of both of them, is a deep mistrust and opposition to American-led Atlanticism. Not to mention both Russian Orthodoxy and Islamic tradition share a similar feverish religiosity, shared cultural traditions such as anti-LGBT rights, defined gender roles, etc., and an intense conservatism. Iran would be the key ally for Russia. The Caucasus would belong to Russia once again, and notably Russia would cause some shockwaves through Turkish society, destabilizing them so they are more reliant on Russia and less so on Europe, which has been evident in news of late with Erdogan and his seemingly endless fall from favor, both within Turkey and outside of Turkey, particularly within the EU. For the rest of Asia, a key geopolitical strategy is that China must be broken up. Tibet, Xinjiang and Mongolia must all be taken by Russia as China presents an immediate threat to Russian dominance in the region. However, Dugan still favors ties with them because, you guessed it, China also has a long history of being an adversary of American Atlanticism. As a proposed compensation for taking China's land, Russia would supposedly offer them Southeast Asia and Australia. 
And whilst the geopolitical strategies, annexations and alliances in Asia and the Middle East haven't been prophesized at all so far, his European geopolitical predictions have been spot on. And so have his ways to disrupt American society. At the core of the strategy is to subvert American democracy. For the destabilizing of American society, Dugan suggested that they fuck it up internally, essentially inflaming divisions on race, sectarian groups, and to propagate and inflame the extremist fringes of both the left and right. This has become all too real, as National Intelligence Director Dan Coates told Congress, we expect Russia to continue using misinformation, propaganda, social media, false flag personas, sympathetic spokespeople and other means of influence to try to exasperate social and political fissures in the United States. Not to mention the links between these two guys. The Russian troll farms, disinformation campaigns and cyber attacks on the Atlantic, online psyche and the disruption it has caused and divisions it sowed are classic textbook Duganist implementations. The end goal for all this being that the US and to some extent its NATO allies are all deeply divided and thus governance is harder to maintain, incite a flurry of separatist secession groups, essentially galvanize what Tocqueville called the tyranny of the majority in democratic states to destabilize the fabric of democracies around the world, showing its farcical nature and its deep divisions and mistrust we all share for one another. Whether these seeds of divisibility will bear any prosperity for Russia in the new century, we will find out. What is eerie is how precise, meticulous and thought out Dugin's predictions and hopes for geopolitical strategy were from all the way back in 1997. The Western order has been thoroughly destabilized in the last decade. Not necessarily through Russia, but it has played out perfectly for them. Our distrust in the media and our political elites are at record lows and we've all receded back into identitarian definitions of ourselves. Whether it be on race, gender, sexuality, religion or political leanings, we are confused and disorientated, and it is all beginning to lurk like a Sokovian Duganist dream. The foundations of geopolitics and the ideas espoused by Dugin were largely influenced by the work of Carl Schmitt, whose conservative framework for a new international order influenced the Nazis and also influence national Bolshevism, which leads us right into our last and final man, who didn't necessarily shape Russian politics, but is a product of the turbulent ideological political times of contemporary Russia. His name is Eduard Limonov. Edward Limonov is, in my opinion, the accumulated result of the ideas propagated by Surkov, Ilyin and Dugin. He is the product of the system masterminded by Putinism, Dugin and Surkov, and they hate him for it. He is a reflection of the deceit, the scheming, the plotting and the cynicism at the heart of contemporary Russian politics. Limonov is a fascinating man. Born in Russia in 1943, he was an avant-garde poet who emigrated from the Soviet Union in 1974 after refusing to work with the KGB in forming on fellow artists in the Soviet Union. He then became stateless for 13 years, spending a lot of that time in New York where he became active in the local punk scene that was emerging in New York during this time, hanging around the likes of Ramones and Patti Smith in CBGBs. Whilst living abroad, he continued to write, his most notable piece of work is It's Me, Eddie, a scandalous piece of fiction that deals with the explicit underbelly of New York City during the 70s. Liminov in his writing explores how that even the promised land of the West was still filth, describing America as a damned outhouse bereft of spirit or purpose on the outskirts of civilization. He later moved to Paris where he became active in the literary circles of Paris. In many ways, Liminov was a product of the turmoil and a singular representation of the transition between the old vanguard of the radicals and the ushering in of the neoliberal end of history phase of the latter half of the 20th century. Liminov returned to Russia in 1991 and by all accounts he despised what the country had become. He despised the rise of neoliberal policies in Russia and in response, along with Dugin, formed the National Bolshevik Party 
a party that intended to fuse the ultra-left with the ultra-right as a reaction against the neoliberal takeover of Russia in the tumultuous 90s. Dugin describes the National Bolshevik Party as a political art project that he and Limonov created as a way to stir the pot and reignite a feeling of Russian greatness in the tumultuous 90s. In fact, it was in the MPB headquarters where Dugin wrote Foundations of Geopolitics. The National Bolshevik Party was organized around Limonov, who played the role of the fascist leader, with Dugin being the second in command as the party's chief ideological architect. So what was the National Bolshevik Party? Well, it was more influenced by German, not Russian, National Bolshevism. They were against what they termed Jewish capitalism and advocated for an alliance against Western neoliberalism and hegemony. They essentially fused Nazism and communism together, which is obvious when you see their flag. The slogan of the party also evokes the nationalist rhetoric we have come to see with Surkov and Dugin, the slogan being, Russia is everything, the rest is nothing. I should note that the party did shift on the political spectrum over the years. After Dugin left in 1998, the party became more left-wing and denounced anti-Semitic rhetoric in the party. Though that said, the party was still a gateway for many Russians into national sentiments. You see, for all of Limonov's disagreements with Putin and the wider Russian establishment, Limonov did understand the inherent power one can have over the masses by utilizing nationalist rhetoric. This is probably most evident in one of the rare times that Limonov supported Putin when he annexed Crimea, as he supported Russian dominance and military might, especially over Ukraine. Again, utilizing nationalism and us versus them rhetoric goes a long way in galvanizing support within the party. The party also became infamous for its countercultural influence. Limonov imported a lot of the punk rock aesthetics he had become enamored with in the West into the style and aesthetics of the party, its publications and its approach to dissent. It attracted a lot of skinheads and misfits into its ranks, galvanized them all into a new vision for how Russia could be. He has become famous for his influence on the youth of Russia. During protests and demonstrations, his young followers act as a security force around him, preventing any Russian police or security from arresting him, often becoming injured in the process. The party and Limonov became staunch opponents of Putin, stating that they imagined a new Russia. MBP spokespeople state in 2004 that the main goal of the National Bolshevik Party is to change Russia into a modern, powerful state, respected by other countries and peoples and beloved by its own citizens, by ensuring the free development of civil society, the independence of the media and social justice. The party was later banned by Putin in 2007 for being what he termed extremist. Limonov has been arrested, once serving four years in prison for weapons charges and has maintained being a perpetual nuisance for the Russian elite throughout his life, be it Soviet or Putinist, something he is very proud of. Limonov became the conflict in Russian politics that was needed in the Yalston and early Putin years. The establishment hated him. He was a dissident throughout his youth and continued the rebellionist right into his adulthood where he continued to wreak havoc. When Russia was trying to reinvent itself as a culturally conservative, gangster capitalist state, Limonov was the ghost of their past, a spectre who haunts and reminds the Russian establishment who they really are. He's described as a very Russian phenomenon, a reflection of the breathtaking intensity that distinguishes life in Russia. He is the reminder to all the Russian elites who they really are, what their country is, and what this fight for the future of Russia is up against. But just like the Russian establishment, Limonov fucking hated the West. He hated how they have infected Russian society. But in some regards, his hate for the West is a hate for neoliberalism. He can see, quite succinctly, how neoliberalism has killed culture in the West. In Russia, he claims that people at least still hold on to their barbarian fighting spirit that he hoped to galvanize with the National Bolshevik Party. But in the West, he says that European and Americans are sick invalids. Gone. Too late to save. Engulfed by the ominous neoliberal force that turns culture into a carbon manufactured copy of its nostalgic past. And this is what is fascinating about Limonov. He has no illusions as to who is to blame. Yes, he hates the West, 
but his disdain doesn't seem to be one based on history. His hate is very contemporary. He hates the force of neoliberalism and how it is coming for Russian society. He quite clearly makes a distinction in his rhetoric and his actions that he hates neoliberal policies and how they are infecting the Russian establishment. Whilst Putin, Dugin, Surkov stoke up anti-Atlanticist sentiments, Limonov is the man that holds up the mirror to point out their hypocrisy for allowing the Russian state to have been manipulated by Western financial elites. Russia is allowing the neoliberal, a Western invention, to seep into the fabric of their society and ruin the greatness of Russia. Limonov died in 2020, a rebel throughout his life. His ideas live on through the other Russia of E.V. Limonov party, a party he founded in 2010. A party that in true Limonov fashion hopes to unite social democrats, liberals, nationalists and Bolsheviks under one movement. The party is still active and has members still fighting against neoliberal corruption and being arrested today. Whilst his time in Russian politics in the 21st century has been of dissent, rebellion and protest, Limonov serves as a reminder of the fighting spirit that he is still present within Russian society. Him, along with people at the other end of the political spectrum, like Pussy Riot and Navalny, are products of the turbulent history, both contemporary and long ago, and are all proof that the ghost of Russian history still haunts the Russian establishment. Russia has long been shaped by rebels and outsiders. Some often infiltrate the inside whilst others remain firmly on the outside. You see, the dissidents, rebels and punks all serve as a reminder that the fate of Russian history has not yet been decided. The question of what Russia will become is still very much anyone's guess. Russia has an extraordinary history and is a proud country that has a history of fighting for its future. How the fight will be swayed and influenced by whom is anyone's guess. But from historical knowledge, it appears that the ideologues who control the people in power from behind the curtain are the ones to watch when thinking about where Russia is heading. This has been The Men Behind the Curtain, presented by me, Haiku. Thank you very much for watching this video. I'll be dropping some more in the future. Visit the show notes on my website below and please consider supporting me on Patreon and giving me a follow on Twitter. Also, a like and share of this video is hugely appreciated. All support goes a very long way. See you all soon.